as the Gideons were uh, making a Bible Blitz distribution at the university in Mexico City. Mexico. Fella came up and said, I'm a Satanist. I worship Lord Satan. And he uh, said, I'll show you. I meant to demonstrate, but I, here it is. Tell you what I think of this book. And he got out his lighter and he took and took the fire to the pages and it wouldn't burn. And he tried again and it wouldn't burn. And he got disturbed and he ran away. A little while later, he came back. He said, I want to apologize for the way I was acting. I was really rude. But he said, there's something about this book that I, I don't understand. I, I couldn't burn it. Something supernatural here. What's going on? And so they get in. They took the time and showed that there's helps in the front. And, of course, a few scriptures. And in the back, of course, is the way of salvation and Gideon Testaments. And they spent some time with him. And he was overwhelmed and accepted the Lord at that point Amen. from a Satan worshiper. Doesn't that make a good testimony? Doesn't end there. There were three guys across the street. They were observing what was going on. And they said, we recognize that guy that was just here and he's a Satan worshiper and it looked like he was down on his knees praying and that doesn't make sense. <laughs> So again, the Gideon shared with these three men what was going on. And of course, they take a few minutes and get to the plan of salvation. They also professed Christ at that point. Amen. That is impressive because I one time witnessed to a guy for 13 years before he got it. They did it in a few minutes. Why? Because God had them ready. We don't do it. God does it. Well, in Ephesians verse 5, 16, we read, Because the days are evil. That's a rather straightforward discussion. In my Bible study, it says, You have one life to live. Don't waste it. Well, that's a good way. My mother-in-law had the phrase that went along with that. You only have one life to live. Only what's done for Christ will last. Well, we now live with COVID. God knows our circumstances. But we have to continue to get the gospel, at least to the next generation. Jesus came to save the lost, and his last words to the disciples were that they would receive the Holy Spirit and become witnesses to the ends of the earth. Well, Gideons are involved in extending that witness to the ends of the earth. Now, in 200 countries, it's been going on for a little over 120 years. So a few people had the vision 120 years ago, and God has honored us to this point. 100 different languages, and your speaker, I guess, comes pretty regularly here at this church. If they mentioned about the Bible app card to get the Bible I have some I can share it with you, but if there's a Bible app and the Gideons have it now, I found in 17 languages and dialects. So when you open it up, you pick the language and there it is in audio. Awesome. So it's more than just getting the books out. But the promise is from Isaiah 55, 10 and 11. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, and my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts, as the rain comes down, the snow from heaven, but waters the earth, God's word will give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall be the word from my mouth. It shall not return to me void. Amen. Awesome. I got to tell you about Randy, another university student, and he was given a Bible, and a lot of times students don't want to read the whole book. They want to go to the synopsis at the end. He says, that's a pretty good-sized book. I'll go to the end and see how it ends. And so he, 
Yeah, he gets into Revelation and he's gone through three chapters in Revelation. He says, well, looks like Jesus won. I better read the rest. Amen. He did. Got saved, finished his degree, got a job, later became a Gideon, and now has an opportunity to go to universities much like he did. So we never know how God's going to get a hold of people. Well, then there was another university student, and he was also in Revelation. He went to Re Revelation 2015. It's familiar about the Book of Life. He said, looks like it'd be pretty important to have my uh, name in that Book of Life. How do you do that? And so then he had to investigate and, of course, came to the Word also. Well, think about that. I gave two examples from Revelation. When our evangelistic services and training where do we go? We're trained to go to Gospels, go to John, obviously Romans. We don't think of a place like Revelation. Well, if they're Jewish, you go to Isaiah. You send them to Isaiah and try to figure out if they can get that. Well, you see, all Scripture is valuable, so it doesn't matter where it is. When we look at that, it's all valuable. The Holy Spirit's going to do the work and bring people to Christ. Now, when you hear the name Gideon, you probably often think of the hotels and motels. True. But it's much more than that. And since 1899, the object has been to strengthen the testimony of Christian business and professional men and to have an opportunity to share scriptures. It took a few years. Well, the ministry was only evangelism. It was about uh, eight or nine years that... Uh, ministry went to the hotels and at the beginning it was just put a hotel bible at the desk and people could ask for it when they're there and of course later expanded to, to get it all the rooms that we can so we were grateful for that so there's a team effort obviously also with our wives as auxiliary and placing bibles in places that sometimes churches don't have an opportunity we have an opportunity to witness that sometimes there's other open doors uh, like uh, the hospitals, nursing homes, missions, like the city mission, and to get the students and uh, prisoners, fire, medical personnel, armed forces, to catch most of them. Well, by God's grace, last year, over 70 million were distributed somewhere in the world to touch people's lives. So we are encouraged to share the gospel as Gideon's, at least once a week. And sometimes you do more and sometimes less, but there's, there's the goal. Recently at a Cracker Barrel restaurant, <clears throat> waitress was kind of uh, liberal, I guess would be one way to say it. And I, and I figured she needed Jesus. And I had just finished a prayer session with the Gideons of talking about being sending out the scriptures and I was in that meeting and I didn't I didn't have any in my pocket and it was a test I said, how many you have and didn't so when I got to the car I made sure that I was loaded I had them in my pocket and it was great so here's this girl and I I had that and a few people I had earlier I had the ticket to heaven to make sure that you get your ticket to heaven I had that with this and so in a few short moments right there I said uh, I'd like to give you this Bible and she paused, and it caught me off guard. You want to give me this Bible? Free? What's going through her mind? She said, Bibles are expensive. I'm thinking, wait a minute. This is the United States. They're not expensive. That's what she thought. I said, here, read it. It'll change your life. And also had the track with the ticket to heaven. But I said, the most important part, that track and in the back here, is that God's got a plan for you. Read these and study these. And she says, I will. So I look at that as being a God-appointed moment. I don't know how it answered, but I thought, how could she not get it after something like that? She must have accepted. That's what we go by. We also reach out to the youth. We have a life book, and I 
had one last week and gave it away and I don't have one, but youth pastors and people that work with youth have an opportunity to get them sent to you at a hundred at a time to be given to the teenagers so that they can share it with their friends at school. If we can't get Bibles in school, the teenagers can come in. This life book is the book of Mark, and it has notes written from uh, teenagers and also a few adults for little comments to go along with it. You can download that on your computer. Go to lifebook.com. You can download a free copy, and you'll see what this is all about. There were Gideons in New Zealand. New Zealand approaching uh, school trying to get into a place that wasn't very big. The principal said, uh, tell you what I'll do. I'll send a letter to all the parents, and if they agree, then you can come back and pass them out. So a few months later, they went back to see if the approach was there, and the principal says, I tell you what, I got one letter back. You can pass out one testament to one individual. And while they're by the office, another teacher heard the men and said, do you have 20 more? I have a class of 20. And I know the regulations. I know all of the families. And I know that they would say this is okay to pass them out. So they passed out 21. As the teacher was letting the men pass them out, she shared her testimony with the class. Her testimony was that she'd made some really poor choices in life. She was on drugs. Her grandmother encouraged her to read the Bible and change her life. It did, and she could be uh, salvaged and now become a teacher to work with young people. So it's amazing to think that in her testimony, she called it she had selfish lifestyles and God got control of that. I had another one from a fraternity, kind of quick, and this one catches me. There was a fraternity in a university that was about to be kicked out, and the men in the group figured they were going to be out. The president says, we should start a Bible study. You're kidding me? We don't know anything about the Bible. Well, as they were leaving, it happened to be a day that the Gideons were at the university passing out a Green Testament to the men, and here he was given one going out the door. And so when they went back to the meeting, they said, uh, I have a testament. And another one of the brothers said, well, I, I got one here. That's bigger than yours. And the uh, guy says, well, I don't know. I, let's, let's work on the little one. I like that. It's smaller. And so they started reading, not knowing what to read. They went through uh, the book of Matthew, and they're reading through it, and they figured out, well, Jesus got crucified. So they went on, read some more. They went into Mark and kind of perplexed. This dude got crucified again. And they, they went to Luke, and here it is all over again. Doesn't this guy get it? They're going to crucify him. Can you imagine their limited knowledge at that particular point? So I understand it. God got a hold of these men in that fraternity, and it didn't get kicked out. And I understand that president became a preacher, and I've got to document that somewhere. I heard it in another church, but I can't verify it. Boy, I would love to get the names for that one. Well, you see, God's at work. He was work uh, at the beginning with uh, the Bible wouldn't burn. God was at work. He was at work in these lives. We have had opportunities to be to prisons and to schools. Obviously, it got restricted somewhat during COVID, but that has been returned. God's at work in the prison. I spend Sunday nights at the Elbin facility. And when we first went back after COVID, only two showed up. And I thought, okay, this is the first time. Let's see what happens. And then it doubled to four. Well, that's a good number. And then it got all the way up to 13. And then kind of settled down around 10, 11, something like that. 
Here's an opportunity. These men are really, they know about their problems. They also know about the scripture, but now they want to really get into the discussion. So I call it a Bible study and discussion. And it's kind of a round table thing where everybody participates. And sometimes a chaplain comes in and joins us, but it's just amazing to see how these men are on fire for the Lord. Some of them someday will be back out on the streets with us. I pray that they be able to maintain their walk with the Lord so when they come out, they don't fall into where they were before. God will honor that. Uh, I didn't talk about an offering. I know you're a regular church, so there is a program uh, that's mentioned in our outline, and I don't know if it was talked before, but there's a program now called Birthday for Jesus. You uh, put things on the Christmas tree and you take save money for a birthday offering and Christmas. There's material for that. I can help on that. I don't have any with me, but this is really something. I don't mention a lot with some churches because if you're regular, you're, you're already involved. You're praying, you're supporting, and, and that just overwhelms all of us because we need that. Uh, I understood somewhere that there's these Gideon cards in your church that you use and the price for the Bible is $5 and $1.60 for the Testament. I have one here. It's a thinking of you. You send to somebody and then there's the offering envelope that goes to the local treasurer. Well, you see together, we work together on this. Jesus said in John 10, 16, other sheep I have which are not of this fold them also I must bring. One by one, certain of his sheep will occupy a hotel or motel room somewhere in the world as God purposes. Each will be directed by the Holy Spirit to read the Bible that you and I helped place. Awesome. I have a two minute, 20 second video that I think if the IT person, we looked at it earlier, uh, we'll go for that. Maybe. And if not, it doesn't matter, but it worked earlier. There it is. For some, it's an escape. For others, it's information. For many, it's an adventure. For us, it's truth. The foundation of our faith. It changes who we are to the very core. It brings hope, strength, comfort, direction, protection, answers. It confirms our identity and reminds us we are loved, that we have worth, that we may be forgiven. That's the power of this book. It's a message that can give someone life. And we believe that everyone needs to hear this message. But there are people all across the world who've never held a Bible in their hands, who have never read it, some who don't even know it exists, but they need to. And with your help, they can. We are called to share the Word of God with the world, from those right next door to those all across the globe. And in over 200 nations, our members desire to leave no person unreached. We're going to the ends of the earth to bring hope to people who need it. And as long as there are people who do not know Jesus, the work of sharing this book with the world is not finished. Because if we have nothing else but the Word of God, we have everything. We lack nothing. That's the power of the Bible. It offers eternal life. Join us in bringing the source of truth to the world. Thank you. God bless you. Amen. Thank you, Brother Phil, for presenting the, the work of the Gideons. <clears throat> At the end of this, we'll... 
Brother Andy, come up here. You've been a Gideon for a while. Yes. If anybody does have any questions later on, Chuck Wilson and I are both Gideons and have been for a while. And uh, right in McKean County, we give out hundreds of testaments every year. We have what's mm -hmm. called Camp Penuel coming up here shortly and uh, next month in July. And we get a lot of inner city kids and stuff that come to that. And we have the opportunity to distribute the word of God to them. But it all costs money. And it's a gift from the churches when we hand it out to them. We let them know it's not coming from us. It's coming from you guys. So if you do feel led to give to the Gideon ministry, you can see Chuck. He's our treasurer. So he handles that end of it. Amen. Amen. You can, for that offering, you can go and talk to Brother Chuck after service if you'd like to give to that. I highly encourage that. It's a ministry. Amen. So praise the Lord for that. When I go to hotels, I look for the Gideon's Bible. <laughs> I go, oh, I'm going to open up all the drawers, you know. <laughs> I'm going to go find one. <laughs> so praise the Lord. I go looking for him because I say, praise the Lord that there's. Amen. I've never been to a hotel room where there wasn't. So I've never had to do that. <laughs> Recently in our publication, there was a brand new hotel in Philadelphia a few years ago, and they said no Bibles. Four years later, they ask for them. Amen. Amen. That's a lot of Bibles. Praise the Lord for that. If you want to give to the Gideon's ministry, again, Chuck is in the back. He is a Gideon, and he is a treasurer. Praise the Lord. As for today's sermon, amen. You can turn your Bibles. To, I, I'm not letting you off the hook. Pastor wouldn't. So, <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10. Oh, the kids. Kids, if you're a child, 11 years or under, maybe a little more. Kids, you are dismissed. William, I think you're one, two. And, and a little patience. Patience. Need patience with patience. Amen. Hebrews chapter 10. No. <laughs> patience amen praise the lord for kiddos i love hearing the chirps in the back i love hearing it don't dis don't ever despise the kids running around in the back you we would much rather have that than to have silence amen so praise the lord for the little running across the across the back row there so praise the lord praise the lord Hebrews chapter 10. I was trying to think. That in college, they teach you to give a proposition. God wants you to. God wants you to know how awesome a sacrifice that Jesus Christ gave for us this morning. How awesome a sacrifice he gave for us. Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to be looking at verse 1. And we're going to go down through how sh how long should i make you guys stand for 18 we'll go 1 through 18 if you can stand for the reading of god's word i'll try to make it a little shorter today since we had a gideon's amen hebrews chapter 10 verse 1 says for the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect for then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins." Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, who's I? Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. 
above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hast pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said I, then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which Will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Whereof the Holy Ghost is also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. You may be seated. Let's go to the Lord and pray. God, I do thank you for your word. I pray that you bless it now as it is being preached. I pray this in your holy and precious name, Jesus. Amen. As I was praying and considering what God had laid on my heart, he laid in my heart this morning, because I had two other sermons ready. He laid in my heart this morning the magnificence, the awesome sacrifice that Jesus Christ gave for us. Jesus' sacrifice was necessary. If you take a look at verse 23, it says, it's not the right verse. <laughs> it's not the verse that I meant to write down. Amen. Jesus' sacrifice was necessary. To define that, necessary means that it had to come. It, he had to die. He had to come. He had to live. He had to die. It was necessary. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 6, and this is the right verse. Hebrews 8 and verse 6. It says, But now hath he obtained a much more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Verse 7, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Again, we'll look at Hebrews chap chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse. We'll look, take a we'll look at verse 1 and then verse, verse 15. It says, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. Verse 15, And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Verse 16, For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of a testator. Jesus Christ's sacrifice was necessary. We look back at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. It talks about, for the law having a shadow of good things to come. In the Old Testament, every year they were giving sacrifices. Yom Kippur, a remembrance of sin made every year. They would kill a bull. They would kill the goat. They would set a goat free. They'd perform sacrifices. There were sacrifices in the Old Testament for sin. But the blood of those animals could never take away their sin. It was the faith that that bull, that goat, that dove, that animal was a picture of of what was better to come. Abraham, who was sacrificing his son, brought his son and said, Son, God will provide himself a lamb. And in John chapter 8, 
Jesus mentions how Abraham saw my day when a lamb was provided, a goat caught in the thickets. His sacrifice was necessary. He had to die. There was no other way to bring that which is better. His sacrifice was necessary. Not only was his sacrifice necessary, but it was once and for all. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11, verses, yeah, 10 through 12, says, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. 11, and every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. God's sacrifice, Jesus Christ's death on the cross, was once and for all. Someone who comes to you and says, at my church, Jesus Christ dies every Wednesday. We have his blood and his body every Wednesday. Incorrect. It was once and for all. Someone who tells you that I have to get saved every week. Every time I come to church, I have to get resaved. There's a lot of churches that believe that. I went to a church before that believed that. Incorrect. God, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins, it said he died and his sacrifice was once for all. There didn't have to be a continuation of it. There didn't have to be a continuing of his shedding of blood. It was a once and for all sacrifice. God's perfect sacrifice. It was a physical sacrifice. Let's see here in verse 5. It says, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Verse 7, Then said I, not you and me, but Jesus Christ, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me. I love that verse, because this Bible from cover to cover. It's written, the volume of the book, the volume of a, if you have a glass of water, the volume that's inside of it, the volume of this book, you can find Jesus Christ on every page of this Bible. Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of him, the Lord Jesus Christ. What did he come to do? He came to sacrifice himself once for all, and he sat down at the right hand of God. It was a one time sacrifice. Notice here, in order for it to be a one time sacrifice, it had to be perfect. It could not have sin, it could not be spotted. It had to be perfect. God's sacrifice, Jesus' sacrifice, was perfect. Verse 13 says, From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Verse 14, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. How could Jesus Christ perfect us? Per, perfect us no, forget the list. Us, if he himself was not perfect. Jesus Christ was the most perfect the most pure, the most just. He is God, and He is perfect. If we look here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, a perfect sacrifice. We talked about a little, a little bit about this this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. I can get there too. I'll get there someday. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in 
him. He was a sinless and perfect man, fully God and fully man. And what he did in his sacrifice was took our sin upon himself. All the wrong that you've done. I've done a lot of wrong in my life. I know I, I tease the teenagers. I won't have them do it this morning right now. But I have them, I always ask them, well, what? I try to give them my testimony a lot. As a young guy, I had long hair. They go, I had long hair and did drugs and all sorts of stuff. I've done a lot of wrong in my life. Amen. I've sinned against God countless times. In and of myself, I still sin against God. I'm a sinner. I am a sinner and so is everyone in this room. We have come against God. We have sinned against God. Our carnal mind has been at enmity with God. And each one of us, I deserved hell. We all deserved hell. Yet Jesus Christ, who loved us, said, All your sin, cast your burden on me. And he took it upon himself, who knew no sin, and defeated it and conquered it. It was a perfect, he was perfect, he is perfect, a perfect substitution. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 28 says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Notice here. He took upon himself our sin. And when we see him, he won't have a spot on him. He conquered that sin. We have the victory through Christ over sin. His salvation is perfect. His sacrifice is perfect. His sacrifice was once and for all. It wasn't a continuation. His sacrifice was necessary. What do you do with this information? What do we do with it? We share it. We should share it. We should go out to the world. We should tell people about the great sacrifice that Jesus Christ has given us. But also we have this in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. In verse, uh, we'll start in verse 18. It says, now, remish, now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Amen. He is the only offering. It is once and for all. There doesn't have to be a continuing of it. And he is still on his throne today. Amen. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near. Christians, with this information of how Jesus Christ, his sacrifice was necessary, and that it was once, and that it was perfect, the first thing we should do with that information is draw near to God. If you are not saved, you're, the first thing you should do with that information is draw near to God. And this is a commandment not without a promise. If you want to take a look in James chapter 4. James chapter 4. Draw near to God. James chapter 4 and verse 8 says, it's not the right verse. What, what, what verse is that? Draw an eye to God, and he will draw not. There you go. Draw an eye to God, and he will draw an eye to you. Is that 4-8? Yep. It is 4-8. What was I looking at then? Was I looking at 3-8? I was looking at 3-8. 4-8. That's the right verse. See, I, I knew better. No, I didn't. <laughs> Amen. I did not know better. James chapter 4 and verse 8. Praise the Lord for technology. God's good. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. There's a promise to that. When you draw nigh to God, he doesn't leave you hanging. He doesn't just say, okay, come on, keep on coming. 
he gets closer to you. The prodigal son, when he left, where did the father stand? Where was the father found standing still? At the end of that road. And when he saw his son coming, he didn't go, all right, well, I'll just wait for him to get here. No, he ran out to his son and he kissed him on the neck. Let us draw near to God. Let us draw near to God. That's Hebrews chapter 10, verses 18 through 22. We shouldn't only draw near to God. A commandment with a promise. Praise the Lord. But we should hold fast to the profession of our faith. 23 says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. God is so good to us. Even when we're not faithful, he abideth faithful. What we do with this information is that, hey, if you have accepted Christ as your, as your Savior, if you've drawn near to God, if you drew, drew near to God, you should hold fast the profession of your faith. What does that mean? How many times do you go to the store in the week? What kind of testimony do you have? Seven times. Yeah, se he has seven times a week. Yeah, he seven days a week. You probably go there several times a day, maybe. You know, hey, you're a lot of us go to the store quite often. What kind of testimony are you bearing? What kind of testimony are you bearing? Holding fast to the profession of your faith isn't only in the in the in the fact of adversity, where someone might be saying, "Well, I don't Christians are are lame." What are you one of the, one of those fogey Christians? That's, that's the time to stand for your faith, right? That's, you can hold fast to your profession then. But let me tell you, you can hold fast to the profession of your faith by going to Walmart and not cussing if you stub your foot. You're showing the testimony of God in your life. You're holding fast the profession of your faith. When you show up to church on Sunday and you tell someone, hey, I can't make it. I can't go to that thing. I can't go to your work party. I'm sorry. I have church that day. Holding fast the profession of your faith. How important is your faith to you? Well, I have something else to do. Uh, I don't have time to make it to all the services, you know. How important is your faith to you? I want my faith to be so important that whenever the church doors are open, I want to be there. I want to be there. I want to be be where God's people are. I want to hold fast that profession. When someone, when I used to, when I went to school, I had to get a taxi to go to church, or Abigail Angus would pick me up to go to church every Sunday. And there were some times where I walked to church as a teenager. And my friends, would they thought I was the weirdest kid because I would do anything to go to church. And I'd go to my Christian school and I'd talk to my friends who were also saved. And they'd say, yeah, my mom and dad, they're dragging me to church. And I just thought, how disappointing. How disappointing to go to church and not to realize how awesome an opportunity that is. That we get to hear the word of God preached. That we get to be around fellow Christians for a time. That's an awesome, fantastic opportunity. Hold fast the profession of your faith. I told my friends, Man, that's really dumb. <laughs> if you're going to church just because your parents drag you, you're dumb. <laughs> that, that's not a good... Why? Why do you feel that way? Don't you realize what Jesus Christ did for you? Don't you realize the uh, awesome, amazing opportunity you have the, to get in his word every day? Don't you realize? Hold fast the profession of your faith. Three, let us provoke. Now, we have, the, <laughs> we have a bad idea of provoking our mind. But in verse 25, we see a, or verse 24, we see a correct, correct way that provoke is used. It says, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another 
and so much the more as you see the day as, days approaching. I wanted to go back a little bit. I forgot to mention. I was talking to someone this week, a grandmother, and she talked about how the mother of her grandchild did not want her kid to know about God. A lot of people, many people, would shy down in that moment. They'd say, okay, well, that's what you want. But holding fast to the profession of your faith, she held the profession of her faith in that moment and said, how can he know about God if he never steps foot in church? How could he ever know anything about God if he doesn't go to church? No, I'm taking my grandbaby to church. That's holding fast the profession of your faith. It's an awesome opportunity. It's not just, oh, we have to go. It's an opportunity. It's a blessing. Let's stand for it. Let's hold fast to it. 1 Corinthians 15.50, I want to go back and also mention this scripture as well. I love, love this scripture. 1 Corinthians 15.58. First Corinthians fifteen fifty eight says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. It's not in vain. It's not for nothing. Man, we get to serve God, we have an opportunity to serve God. And it's not in vain. It's not for nothing. God rewards us for it. Another commandment with a promise. Lastly, and I'll read those verses again. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as ye see the day approaching. Praise the Lord that we have an opportunity on Sundays to gather together. Praise the Lord that even yesterday, a ladies' meeting, people drove from hours away to be here. Praise the Lord. That is an awesome, 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 not forsaking the assembling of ourselves. You hear a church event? Man, I want to go to it. I want to be there. I want to be around where God's people are. I want to be around where people talk about God. If I come to church and all I talk about is hunting, then I'm just, may as well start a sports club. Amen. You may as well start a sports club. Let's go start it somewhere else. We come to church because we're here to bear each other's burdens. We're here to encourage each other in the Lord, to talk to each other about how good God is in our lives. I find myself, even my own conversation, I fade away. Oh, yeah, work was good this week, and uh, yeah, I got this going on and that going on. And, man, I may as well start like a recovery club for workers. You know, hey, <laughs> oh, yeah, had to get up, go to my 9 to 5 again. Uh, him and ha. No. I love being around God's people. I love hearing about what God is doing in your life. Do you love hearing what God's doing in other people's life? Are you too busy talking about your own life? God has given us an opportunity this morning to be gathered around this book, not around any preacher, not me, not Brother Phil, not Brother Mills, pastor. It's because of this right here. It's because of his word. And each, each man that comes to this pulpit, pastor, would tell you the same thing. What a privilege it is to present the Word of God. What a privilege. Throughout your week, do you know you have the privilege to share the Word of God with others around you? Let me ask you, are you drawing near to God in your life? How do you draw near to God? If you're not reading the Word, if you're not praying, I can tell you, friend, that you're not seeking God. You're not drawing near to God. Let me ask you, are you holding fast the profession of your faith? Are you standing for what God stands for? Are you standing on God's side or are you 
kind of wavering around in the middle somewhere. Let me ask you, are you provoking one another to love? Are you encouraging the Christians around you to serve God faithfully more? Let's do that. Let's continue to hold fast. Let's continue to draw near. And let's continue to provoke one another to love in God. Let's go to the Lord and pray. God, I do thank you for this day, and I thank you, God, for the opportunity to talk about your marvelous sacrifice. Lord, it was necessary that you died for us. It was necessary to bring the better covenant. Lord, it was necessary that you died and that you were buried and that you rose again. Thank you for your glorious gospel. Lord, I thank you for your perfect and your once and for all sacrifice, that it didn't need to be continued to be brought forth, that you sat down after your great sacrifice. Lord, let us not forget how great a salvation that we have through you. I pray that we would hold fast and that we would stand for what you would have us to do. I pray that we would provoke one another to love. And I pray that in our daily lives, wherever we are, that we would consider you in our minds and draw nigh to you. I pray this in your holy and precious name, Jesus. Amen.